Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Welcome to our thoughts for the day. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. Well, good morning and welcome to our service, our online service here in Green Island Presbyterian Church. We hope that you know the presence of the Lord wherever you're watching this, on your phone, on a train, in your living room, in the kitchen, wherever you find yourself following this service. Uh, this morning we consider the third coat of Joseph and glory and, and our sort of position of exaltation and our robes, our royal robes that we look forward to in the future. Uh, but that's when we get to be with God. As we move into our service, we want to remember that even though while we're here, that he listens to us, that he leans towards us, uh, that he cares for us and is passionate about us. And so we remember Psalm 116. It says, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy, because he has inclined his ear towards me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. In the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst of Jerusalem. And so we are in the house of the Lord this morning. What should we do? Well, it finishes, it says, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst of Jerusalem, praise the Lord. Let's worship him as he leans towards us. Uh, to listen to us this morning. Let's pray this.
our reading this morning is from chapter 40 of Genesis. We're going to read from verse 14 um, through to the moment where we see uh, Joseph redressed, uh, verse 42. We are jumping forward a bit um, because the passage is so long, but what we do know up to this point is where we left it last week, Joseph's in prison. Um, and we'll pick it up as he has met two characters, a baker and a winemaker. Uh, they bring their dreams to Joseph and he interprets them. Um, it's good for one guy, but for the other, the uh, baker loses his head, the winemaker gets restored to his position, but he was forgotten. Joseph was forgotten uh, following this. Then Pharaoh has dreams. Uh, and at that point, the winemaker, he remembers, wait, I know a guy, it's like that, I know a guy who will be able to interpret this. And that's where we pick up the story. So Genesis chapter 41, verse 14. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they quickly brought him out of the pit. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came in before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph answered Pharaoh, It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favourable answer. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Behold, in my dream I was standing on the banks of the Nile. Seven cows, plump and attractive, came up out of the Nile and fed in the reed grass. Seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly and thin, such as I had never seen in all the land of Egypt. And the thin, ugly cows ate up the first seven plump cows. But when they had eaten them, no one would have known that they had eaten them, for they were all still as ugly as at the beginning. Then I awoke. I also saw in my dream seven ears growing on one stalk, full and good. Seven ears, withered, thin and blighted by the east wind, sprouted after them, and the thin ears swallowed up the seven good ears. And I told it to the magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, The dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has re re revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dreams are one. The seven lean, ugly cows that come up after them are seven years, and the seven empty ears blighted by the east wind are also years of famine. It is as I told Pharaoh. God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. There will come seven years of great plenty throughout the land of Egypt, but after them will arise seven years of famine, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. The famine will consume the land and the plenty will be unknown in the land by reason of the famine that will follow, for it will be very severe. And the doubling of Pharaoh's dream means that the thing is fixed by God and God will shortly bring it about. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man, set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh proceed to appoint overseers over the land and take one fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt during the seven plentiful years and let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh for food in the cities and let them keep it. That food shall be a reserve for the land against the seven years of famine that are to occur in the land of Egypt so the land may not perish through the famine. This proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find a man like this in whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has shown you all this, 
There is none so discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand and put it in Joseph's hand and clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. Amen. This is God's word. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide. And trembles at his voice and trembles at his voice how great is our God sing with me how great is our God and all will see how great how great is our God
to the third coat that we read of uh, Joseph wearing in these final chapters of the book of Genesis. It's the second coat that we've seen given to him. The first coat was the coat of many colours. Uh, the second coat in many ways was taken from him. Uh, but in this third coat we see a coat given to him by Pharaoh himself. And we need to remember at this time Pharaoh was probably the most powerful man in the known world. So up to now, we've looked at the coat of many colours and through the lens of it, we looked at uh, favouritism and pride and jealousy and violence as a result of all of that, that sort of poisonous cocktail. Uh, last week, we looked at temptation and integrity. Uh, so they're kind of heavy, heavy areas of our life to consider. They can be very difficult at times to consider. So today's a more positive theme, our hope today is that we will look at glory, that we will look at what we can look forward to, we will look at the hope that we have within us. At this time of year, that sort of question comes up a lot. At the start of July, folks will say, do you, do you hope to get away on your holidays or where do you hope to get to? And then our kids are now inundated with the question, are you looking forward to going back to school? Are you looking forward to going back to school and I suppose the correct answer is oh yes yes whereas I'm sure inside so many of our kids are screaming they were no I don't want to go back to school and this morning we want to look at something that we have hope for this morning we want to look at something that we look forward to and that is glory but how are how is or how are uh glory and Joseph's third coat connected to him. Well, they're connected through the image of being given a cloak or a robe or a garment that elevates you. In Joseph's case, he was being elevated to being second in the land. And we're not quite sure the exact remit of that post, but he's, he, he's kind of moved pretty quickly. He's moved from, from slavery to imprisonment to being the second in command in the land. I've seen some jobs and they offer a fast track, a fast track uh, career. You know, you'll get promotion quickly, you'll go to management quickly. But I know of no scenarios that any career can offer me where I'll go from an imprisoned slave to being in the government cabinet as the secretary of state or whatever. Now, we know the story well. And sometimes familiarity can, can erode uh, what we read or the attention we pay to what we read. Well, we know it. So the um, Joseph, we left him last week in prison. And in prison, he uh, meets the baker and he meets the, uh, the wine steward. And they have dreams. And we know the dreams work out for one and not the other. The wine steward, he is restored to his former position and authority. And the baker, he loses his head. And there's a great piece of humanity in this passage because uh, probably like me, once the winemaker is restored to his former position of authority, he kind of forgets who helped him. He forgets what happened to get in there. He forgets Joseph. 
But then God moves on Pharaoh and gives him two dreams. In fact, the two dreams themselves are the sign that this is unchangeable. These prophecies are going to come about. And he, he brings together uh, these pieces through the power of the Holy Spirit. And we see that later on in Pharaoh's statement about Joseph. And we see the, the, the gifting of administration within Joseph being uh, matched up with God's will or the Spirit of God to accelerate this, this promotion, if you will. So Pharaoh has dreams, two dreams. Plenty being devoured by wastage. And when the baker finally remembers who Joseph was and says, I know a guy who can interpret dreams. Joseph brought before Pharaoh. And notice that Joseph doesn't say to Pharaoh, I will interpret your dreams. He makes no claim to power or authority here. Rather, he says that God will give the interpretation. And Joseph brings God's word to Pharaoh. But he goes beyond that because what he actually does is he brings the interpretation to Pharaoh and then he actually begins to bring the solution. A course of action. Remember, Joseph is an administrator, an organizer. So his, his, in his gifting, he recognizes what now needs to be done. So he says, plenty is coming, followed by famine. And here's what you should do. And there's this lovely moment where Pharaoh, you can see him turning to his court, all these, you know, sycophants and everything is that would surround him. And he says to them, can we find a man like this? In whom is the spirit of God? Can we find a man like this? In whom is the spirit of God? And the words here used for spirit of God, it, 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 it's Ruach Elohim. He's not referring to the general gods of Egypt, that sort of pantheon of gods. He's not referring to other gods of the ancient Near East. He's, he, he's speaking directly about the Hebrew God. He's speaking about Elohim. He's speaking about Yahweh. And Joseph is this gifted administrator, but the gifting becomes powerful when it is surrendered to the spirit of Yahweh. And used to bring about the will of God. Pharaoh's response actually becomes a foreshadowing of God's response to us all in Christ. This dressing of Joseph. I want to read you a couple of passages. Isaiah 61, 10 and 11 it says this. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall, shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robes of righteousness. Zechariah sees a vision of Joshua standing before God in filthy rags. And we hear the voice saying, remove these filthy rags from him. Behold, I have taken away your iniquity from you. And I will clothe you in pure vestments. Revelation 7, 9 says, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with branches in their hands. What we see in in our passage today, but also in many other passages through Scripture, is this direct connection between being dressed and glory and authority. What we find in Isaiah and Zechariah and Revelation is this connection between being dressed, salvation and glory. And as we've tapped into a couple of times during this Joseph series, when we look at the parable of the two sons and the prodigal son, as we look at those, what is the first thing that the father does to the son? He puts his ring in his finger, that happens with Joseph, and he puts the purple robe around him. What does Pharaoh do? Ring in the finger and he dresses him in clothes of authority. This redressing is significant. It signifies important things in Scripture. 
and Isaiah, we see the subject being covered in robes of righteousness. Like, what do we understand as righteousness? Well, let's keep it really simple. At its simplest, it simply means made right. Something that was offline, something that was broken, something that was misaligned has been made right. But it's more than just made right for us. Because we've not simply been made right by Jesus' death on the cross. We have been, we have been elevated. We have been adopted as sons and daughters of God. The best way I think I can describe this is through pottery. I've spoken about this a couple of times in church. I love there's an art within Japanese pottery to do with brokenness. You know, in the fall, we have become broken. Sin has infected us like a flaw through our DNA. And notice that as man, leave, man and woman leave the Garden of Eden, what does God do for them? He dresses them. But it's very much this, this dress of shame to cover their nakedness. They are ashamed and broken, but God is still caring for them. Now, in the Japanese art of Kintsugi, a piece of pottery that is broken is repaired. Now, repaired, <clears throat> you know, at its root, it, it's repaired. It's things that were connected that have been broken apart. The act of repairing is, is bringing those back together again. Uh, these broken parts are paired again, they are rejoined, they are reconnected, they are reformed with the parts that previously had made them whole. So in, in Kintsugi uh, pottery, the, the pottery is actually rejoined using gold. And what happens then is that the repaired pottery has now taken on more value and worth than the original work. You know, in the fall, we were broken. And the Father dressed us in our shame. But through Jesus, we are repaired. We are made right again. We have been redressed with robes of righteousness. But not just the, to the original state. By being repaired by the blood of Jesus, we have become more than we were before. That which was created and loved has now become adopted and elevated and we will have our home with Jesus and this is our current state we are we have been repaired and we can enjoy the benefits of that both now and in the future the the now and not the now and not yet as we sometimes talk about but we must no doubt be in no doubt as to how this redressing is taking place we didn't redress ourselves we know that joseph didn't dander down to the uh you know the egyptian linen shop and order up a gown of fine wine fine white linen and declare himself to be second in command in the kingdom the one in higher authority redressed him it's the same for us we receive the blessing from god that jesus bought for us and we receive it fully as a gift from him and zachariah we read you know uh, remove these filthy rags for him. Notice the active agent is external. Remove these filthy rags from him. Behold, I have taken your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you in pure vestments. It is God who removes his dirty rags. It is God who takes our iniquity away. We don't do this. It is done for us in a glorious gracious act through christ but like all gifts it has to be accepted it won't be pushed on us our god doesn't force things upon us in grace he presents it to us 
But be in no doubt that it is him that does it. It is he who removes our sins. It is he who removes our filthy rags. It is he who takes our iniquity away from us. And thank God he replaces it with pure vestments, with pure robes. And this, with that, we recognize that we have a future hope. We have this future hope that a day is coming when we will, as Revelation says, be together. Every people from every place, from every time, from every tribe, from every tongue. And when we are gathered, do you know, do you know what we will all have in common? What does the writer here in Revelation say? It talks about a couple of things that we will have in common. But one of them is how we're dressed. After this, I looked and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and holding branches in their hands. When unpacking part of what our future glory looks like, it is how we are dressed that catches the writer's eye. First Corinthians makes it clear that we will be redressed when we go, go to glory. It says that the mortal shall be replaced by the immortal. The perishable will be replaced by the imperishable. To exist in this place where there is no more death. We have this great redressing hope before us. We have this hope of glory. We have this hope of living in complete connection with Jesus, the Father and the Spirit. We will be there with the uh, Ruach Elohim. We have this great hope that all that we could not understand or figure out in this life, that it will be revealed to us there. What a glorious future we have. And within that glorious future, we have new clothes. And as people of the kingdom, it occurs to me that as holders of hope, hope of this glorious future, that there's something of that hope that should be obvious. There's something of this hope that should be pouring out of us, if you will. I have two acquaintances, and they're very different types of people, and they're in very different places, let's say, with COVID. The first fills my ears with the daily doom and gloom, the, you know, the latest terrible figures, and it's getting worse, and it's awful, and there's going to be another shutdown, and the vaccine won't last. In fact, the vaccine might actually be a uh, government tracking system. Uh, the government are lying to us. We'll never be back to normal. It goes on, and it goes on, and it goes on. My second acquaintance is an energetic chap. And rather than the worst and the gloom, he sees opportunities to serve one another. He sees opportunities to be better community, which I frequently have failed to do over this lockdown. You know, he's looking for people to work together, to serve each other, to carry each other, to support one another. And can you guess which one of these two people that I feel uh, drawn to, which of these two people that I want to spend my time with? I want to spend my time with the one who is positive. I want to spend my time with the one who is hopeful. And should these not also be our hallmarks? In this world, should we not be the ones who reveal a glorious future hope by how we live? by how we radiate joy, by, by how we have an uncontainable excitement within us, how we live in joy on a daily basis, not some kind of thin sense of joy, but a joy that relates to a deep inner peace that is so attractive in a world that cannot find peace. You know, when you say someone is a gentleman, 
Is it because they're dressed in a in a dapper suit and a pair of brogues? Or is it rather because of their character? If we say someone is regal, is it because they wear a crown or is it because of how they carry themselves? If we say someone is ladylike, is it because they live in a mansion? Or is it because there's something about them and how they treat others that fits that definition? I think what we mean in all those cases is that something of their inner character carries through into how they behave and live, how they treat others. And it occurs to me, we have been dressed in royal robes. We are going to go on and don robes of glory. Is there not something of that new robe, something of that new creation within us that should be bleeding out into how we act and live and treat others and deal with the ups and downs, the difficulties and the joys of life? Something of how we are dressed should be clear and obvious. We are dressed so differently, spiritually. The king has given us new robes and that should show. Even in the famous passage from First Peter where it talks about this hope within us. It finishes by how we behave. It says this, but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Notice there is this outward aspect even to this great inner hope that we have. Treating each other with gentleness and respect. Who I am should be visible in how I live and treat others. So this morning, we consider who we are. We are a people who have been made righteous. We have been made right. And in fact, through the blood of Christ, which have repaired us, we are actually more glorious than we were ever before. And we recognize that this is all God's action towards us. And so we come unto him with thanksgiving and worship. He has reached down and he has drawn us up. And he has drawn us up and he, is, he, is, he has given us a glorious future. We have a great future hope of eternity in the unfettered presence of God. How marvellous is that? We had filthy rags, but they have been exchanged for royal robes which will one day be exchanged for robes of glory. As we move into this week, may we thank God for all that he has done for us. And may something of this glorious redressing that we have had done to us, may something of that be visible in how we live this week. Amen. What gift of grace is Jesus my
service to a close we do so with the words of the grace and now may the grace of our lord jesus christ and the love of god and the fellowship of the holy spirit be with you now and forevermore amen